Maybe you've caught the program while flipping through the channels on your TV, Dancing with the Stars. It's been a wildly popular TV show, number one in its time slot. And So You Think You Can Dance is another hit show with a collection of young dancers competing in a rapid-fire series of, of traditional and contemporary dance styles. Combine these shows with several movies that have come out lately, like Dance With Me, Take the Lead, and Step Up, and you have a genuine dance sensation that seems to be sweeping the nation. What's surprising, even shocking, given our couch potato tendencies, is that Americans aren't simply watching these shows. No, as a matter of fact, Americans are actually hitting the dance floor themselves. Tango, swing, and ballroom dancing have been on the rise for more than a decade. Studios are seeing a 30 to 40 percent increase in students during the past 10 years, despite the fact that dance lessons can cost up to $100 an hour. So we're not only watching dance, we're doing dance, or trying to anyway. And with the rising popularity of reality TV dance shows, this white-hot trend shows no sign of cooling off. In today's scripture lessons, dancing plays a prominent role. In the Old Testament reading we're considering, King David is dancing half-naked in the capital. In the Gospel lesson, King Herod is entertained by a dance, and John the Baptist loses his head. In the psalm that we read, the ascent to the holy hill no doubt involved some dancing as the, as the procession approached the sanctuary. In our Old Testament lesson, we take up the story of King David's dancing in the streets. From all accounts, he has all the, the chops to make this work. He would have been an excellent contestant on Dancing with the Stars because he was as big a celebrity as football player Emmett Smith, dance champion of the 2006 season. In 2 Samuel 6, David and his people bring the Ark of God to Jerusalem. As they make their way to the city, David and all the house of Israel are dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and, and castanets and cymbals. It's an incredibly joyful worship experience, full of music and shouting and, and enthusiastic movement. How they cut loose together, writes Presbyterian author Frederick Buchner, David and God were whirling around before the ark in such a passion that they caught fire from each other and blazed up in a single flame of magnificence. Not even the scolding that David got from his wife Michael afterward could dim the glory of it. David does quite a dance before the ark. It's nothing if not enthusiastic, a, a word from the Greek that originally meant in God, and Theos, in God, and David's wife Michael, the daughter of Saul, his rival for the throne and first king of Israel. Well, she absolutely hates it. It feels awkward to her, as dancing often does, embarrassing, inappropriate, and according to Second Samuel, she despises him in her heart. Maybe we can sympathize with Michael. She wasn't an evil woman, but she had a hard time with David's enthusiasm. Today, when Christians from Ghana bring their offerings forward in worship, they move in a dance of celebration and liberation and joy in the Lord. But many American Christians struggle with this. After witnessing a Ghanaian offering, one woman said, If they want to worship that way, fine with me, but don't bring it into my sanctuary. They were running up and down the aisle hollering, I'm happy, I'm happy. Well, as I say, if they want to do that, that's their business, but why do I have to sit there and listen to it? Most of us don't want dance in worship. It feels awkward, embarrassing, inappropriate. As the woman said, don't bring it into my sanctuary. So, shall we dance? Many of us would rather not. We much prefer one of the works of Paul Taylor, who is a fairly innovative American dancer and choreographer. He once performed a modern dance solo in which he simply stood motionless on stage for four minutes. He just stood still, not moving a muscle, and he called it a dance. Now, it's hard to know what to say about such a dance, but one reviewer for a dance magazine responded appropriately. His review consisted of just four inches of white space. He wrote nothing about nothing. The dancing many Christians do in church tends to be quite similar to Paul Taylor's solo. What many of us Christians do is nothing. We just stand still, if indeed we're standing, or sit still, hardly moving a muscle. Our worship of God involves our minds, our hearts, and our tongues, but rarely our whole bodies. Michael, David's wife, would certainly approve. There's a serious problem with this, and it has nothing to do with whether we actually allow dance in worship or not. The dancing question is really a distraction. The real issue is much deeper. Our main problem today is a lack of enthusiasm. We have become so concerned with feeling awkward or embarrassed or inappropriate as Christians that we have choked much of the enthusiasm out of our worship to God. And here's the real tragedy. If we aren't enthusiastic, then we aren't entheos. We aren't in God. So how do we get back into God? An excellent start is to learn the steps to good dancing and apply them to Christian discipleship. 
These include teamwork, breathing, studying, and being willing to have fun. Step 1. Teamwork. Dancer Janet Newman makes the point that square dancing can really work only where there is teamwork. The same is true of our service to God. Notice that King David didn't perform a solo in front of the ark, but David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord. That's teamwork, and it's essential to real success. Whether you're dancing in a group, singing in a choir, building a Habitat for Humanity house, or participating in a small group Bible study, when you're working as a team, there's very little chance of awkwardness or embarrassment. In 2 Samuel, the only one who despises David is Michael. And notice where she is, looking out her window, outside the circle of dancers. Step 2. Breathing. Ballet dancers will tell you that breathing is an essential part of dance, and that you'll never make it through a performance unless you learn how to breathe. Hold your breath, and you'll tire out quickly because your muscles won't get the oxygen they need. As Christians, we need the breath of God to fill us if we're going to do the work that God wants us to do. Remember that Adam was lifeless until the Lord breathed into his nostrils the breath of life in Genesis 2.7. And the people of God were dead bones until the breath came into them and they lived, according to Ezekiel 37.10. In the same way, we cannot serve God well unless we open ourselves to the Holy Spirit and breathe deeply in prayer. It is only when we ask for the Lord to fill us that we will be inspired. A word that means to breathe into or fill with the Spirit. Inspired. David was breathing deeply as he danced before the Lord with all of his might in verse 14 of our Old Testament lesson. And God gave him the energy to bring the ark all the way from Baal Judah to Jerusalem. And step three, studying or practicing. As everyone knows, there are good dances and bad ones. But to discover the difference, we have to study. The Gospel lection for this Sunday tells the story of how a certain dance was used not to praise God, but to put John the Baptist to death. King Herod is throwing himself a birthday party, and he is so pleased by the dance of his daughter that he says to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. After consulting with her mother, the little girl rushes back to Herod and requests, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. You see that in verse 25 of our lesson from the Gospel in Mark 6. Herod is deeply grieved by this request, yet he doesn't want to refuse the girl. He loses his head while watching the beautiful dance. And now, to keep a promise, John the Baptist is going to have to lose his. So Herod sends a soldier of the guard, and in short order, John is killed, and his head is placed on a platter for the girl and her mother, in verses 26 to 28. So the question, shall we dance, cannot be answered with an easy yes or no. Study of Scripture reveals that dance is good if it's truly enthusiastic, truly in God. Our Lord certainly wants us to feel passion, as David did, and to be willing to lose it in joyful praise and thanksgiving. But watch out. Dance can be dangerous if it becomes a human-centered form of entertainment cut off from God, one that causes us to lose our heads. Herod was so captivated by the beauty and passion of his daughter's dance that he lost his connection to God, and in the end, he participated in the killing of an innocent man. King David was God-centered, and his dance was heavenly. King Herod was human-centered, and his daughter's dance created hell on earth. The critical choice is to keep God at the center of whatever we say, think, do, and feel. And finally, step four, have fun. You cannot dance well unless you're willing to cut loose and have some fun, and the same is true in lives of Christian discipleship. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, says Jesus to his disciples. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. That's from John 15, 9 and 11. As people who are secure in the love of Christ, we can step out in faith and have some fun. Jesus wants our joy to be complete. We don't have to worry about being superhuman and saving the world because we serve a Savior who has already saved the world. Don't get so serious that you can't laugh in church or tell a joke or be lighthearted. Rather, we have to be able to cut loose, to share the love and to feel the joy by combining teamwork good breathing, careful study, and a willingness to have fun, we'll be able to serve the Lord with the enthusiasm of King David before the ark. We'll be entheos, in God. And if anyone will despise us for that, then we can simply feel sorry for them. Amen.